Hi, everyone. In this lesson, you're going to learn about viruses, which are a very important microbe that is very different than bacteria. Viruses are very significant and they have a big impact on human health. There are many different examples of viruses medically, and here are just a few examples in these images. So for example, HIV can cause AIDS, which is a severe loss of immunity, which makes people very susceptible to infection. Hepatitis, there are various hepatitis viruses. Hepatitis viruses affect our liver in various ways, and they can potentially cause chronic liver disease. Ebola is caused by a virus, and this virus can cause severe bleeding, organ failure, and sometimes often death. Adenovirus is a common virus that causes respiratory infections, it can cause pink eyes sometimes, and it can cause other diseases. We've all heard of influenza. Influenza virus causes the flu, which is a respiratory infection that we've had. And then here is a picture of coronavirus, which we've heard of, and there is a specific strain of coronavirus that causes COVID. And then we've also, here are a few other ones. There's a herpes virus. There's rotavirus. Ro rotavirus is the primary cause of severe diarrhea and especially in young children. So we're going to talk about viruses in this lecture. So in this lecture, we're going to just talk about characteristics of viruses, pretty much how they're not alive, the very simple structure of viruses. We're going to learn about viruses that infect bacteria, and they're called bacteriophage. We're going to talk about viruses that infect humans, which I'm also going to call animal viruses. We're going to talk about the outcomes of viral infections, like what acute means, what chronic viral infection means. We're going to talk about plant viruses. And finally, we're going to talk about something called prions, which is not viruses, but it is an infectious agent. Okay, so starting off in the beginning, I would like everyone to know that viruses are not alive. Despite their huge impact on human health, viruses themselves are not alive. They don't have the meat machinery that is basically the hallmark of life. They can't grow, they can't sustain themselves, and they don't have their own metabolism. So we say that they're obligate intracellular pathogens. That means that they cause disease and they require a host cell to make copies of themselves. So they, we call them obligate intracellular pathogens, and we also call them acellular infectious agents or particles. Acellular means not cellular. Anytime you put A before a word, it means not. And then we say there, notice that I said that they're infectious particles or infectious agents. I didn't say infectious organisms because the term organism implies that something is alive. So I could call bacteria an infectious organism, but for viruses, we typically say infectious particles or infectious agents. So there is that. And then next, just so you are aware, they are not alive, but they require a living host to multiply. Multiply, make copies of themselves, or replicate. Those all mean the same thing. So viruses without a living host, a virus is basically inactive. And so these viruses require a living host, and that living host can be a human, it can be an animal, it can be a plant, it can be bacteria. And what they do is when viruses infect a living cell, they take over our cell's machinery to make more copies of the virus. And this is very important. The reason why viruses themselves are not alive or not a cell, they're not prokaryotic, cells, they're not eukaryotic cells, they are not cells, is because they cannot reproduce or replicate on their own. They can't be grown in lab on their own, unlike bacteria. They don't have their own metabolism, so they can't make ATP, they can't make energy. They don't have ribosomes, meaning that they can't make protein, and then they don't have a nucleus, cytoplasm, or organelles. Another characteristic that is important of viruses is that viruses are really, really small. So I would like you all to know that even though bacteria is very small and bacteria is microscopic, viruses are even smaller. They're incredibly small and they range from 20 to about a few hundred nanometers. So they require an electron microscope, which is the fancy microscope to be seen. 
Bacteria are measured in micrometers, and we can you see them using a typical lab light microscope. Viruses, we cannot. So for viruses, we need an electron microscope. And if we could see viruses under a regular light microscope, it would have been so much easier to diagnose people who potentially had COVID from just taking a sample from their nose and putting it in a light microscope. But we can't do that because they are so small. And also because they are so small, they can penetrate biological filters. So they can go through filters. And that means that if you work in healthcare, you need special face masks to keep viruses out. We, we sometimes call these face masks N95 masks because they have very tiny holes that do not allow viruses to go through. Now, regular face masks, viruses can go through them, but they are still much better, much more protective than nothing, just so everyone's aware. Okay, now we're going to talk about the structure of viruses. It's very important to understand the structure of viruses. And the reason why this is important is we cannot create treatment or vaccines or understand viruses without really understanding their structure. And viruses are actually made up of a very, very simple structure. All they are is genetic material, which I'm going to call nucleic acid. And that genetic material is inside of a protein protein coat that we call a capsid. So basically what a virus is, is nucleic acid or genetic material. That's the same thing. And that genetic material is either DNA or RNA. So some virus viruses that have DNA, we call them DNA viruses. Viruses that have RNA, we call them RNA viruses. And that nucleic acid, that DNA or that RNA is wrapped in a protein coat made out of capsomeres. And we call that protein coat a capsid. That's all a virus is. So all viruses in the world have DNA or RNA, and they also have a capsid, which is a protein coat. Now, in addition to these things, some viruses may or may not have something called spikes and something called envelopes, which we will talk about. Okay, now I'm going to break out, uh, break down every component of a virus. So starting with the nucleic acid. So again, all viruses have nucleic acid either DNA or RNA, and we call that the genome of the virus, the viral genome. So if I ask you what is the viral genome of a coronavirus, I'm basically asking you about the RNA of the coronavirus. So this viral genome has a few genes that are important for the virus's structure, for its survival, for its pathogenicity, meaning its ability to make you sick. And this genome basically carries the blue blueprint for making new viruses. Some viruses have a few genes, others have many genes. So there's different genomes depending on the virus. And then this nucleic acid can be single stranded, it can be double stranded. And this what viruses do is they use the metabolic machinery of the host, such as humans, if they're infecting human cells, and then they may, they use our enzymes to make new copies of their viral genome, whether that's DNA or RNA, so that they can make new copies of the virus to go on and infect other cells. One more thing about the nucleic acid or the viral genome, just keep in mind that it can either be DNA or RNA, but not both. So, so far in our world, we know that some viruses are DNA viruses, some are RNA viruses. And then also just keep in mind that the DNA or RNA can be single stranded or double stranded. So you can look up any virus online. Some viruses are single stranded DNA viruses, some are double stranded DNA viruses, some are single stranded RNA viruses, some are double stranded D RNA viruses. So basically both of them, DNA or RNA, they exist as single stranded or double stranded. There's also something called positive sense strand and negative sense strand. So when we look at single stranded RNA viruses, positive single stranded RNA viruses those viruses can directly, when they infect a human cell, for example, they can directly use the human's machinery to make protein from that RNA. 
For negative single strand RNA, you have to convert it first. So it requires some work. There's also double stranded RNA viruses, which contain two strands of RNA, and they require their own unique transcription and replication ways. There's single stranded DNA viruses, which have to become double stranded to get incorporated in the host. And then there's double stranded DNA viruses, which are basically easy to make copies of. So the take home message I want you to know from this slide for my students is just basically know that viruses can be DNA viruses or RNA viruses. They can be single stranded or double stranded. This right here is just extra information, but this is the main part of what I want you to know. Okay, the next part. So after our nucleic acid, all viruses also have a protein coat called the capsid. And honestly, the purpose of this capsid, this protein coat, is to protect the DNA or the RNA of the virus. So it has two purposes. It's to protect the nucleic acid. That's one purpose. And the other purpose of a viral capsid is to help the virus attach to host cells. The capsid also determines the shape of the virus. And just keep in mind that this capsid or this protein coat may or may not contain spikes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So that's the capsid. And again, its role is to protect the virus's genome and also to help the virus attach to host cells. And it determines the shape. So when we talk about the shape of viruses, they can be, the shape of viruses can be split into different shapes. So viruses that look helical, we call them helical viruses. Examples of helical viruses are like Ebola. Ebola can cause severe bleeding. It's a very bad infection to have. There's polyhedral viruses, which mean many sides. An example of a polyhedral virus is polio virus, which can cause paralysis. And then there's complex viruses, which an example of that is bacteriophages. I don't want you to memorize the examples. I just want you to know that there can be different shapes of viruses and that th these shapes or these structures are determined by the capsid. Okay, next is envelopes. So some viruses have an envelope. Not all viruses have an envelope, but some do. The envelope, we're going to talk about it later, but if they do have it, it comes from the host cell membrane. And what the envelope does is it basically is an extra layer of protection. So when we look at the envelope, the envelope is a lipid bilayer. And if bacteria have it, we call them enveloped viruses. If they don't, we call them naked viruses. And the envelope looks like the cell membrane of, for example, human cells. So it's taken from the host cell membrane, and it adds another layer of protection for the virus. It's outside the capsid, and it also helps the virus attach to their host cells. It may or may not have spikes. There are advantages and disadvantages to having an envelope for the virus. So if you are a virus and you're an enveloped virus, for example, the influenza virus, which causes the flu, is an enveloped virus. It looks like our cells, our human cells, and this helps the virus hide from our immune system because our immune system cannot always recognize it as foreign. Now, we'll look at other things, but for the envelope, that's one benefit for the virus. So it helps the virus infect new cells also more easily because they can just fuse with the cell membrane of human cells. Okay, disadvantages of having a virus, a, a virus envelope is that the virus envelope is, it's easy to be damaged. So like hand sanitizers, the reason they work on viruses is because they disrupt the envelope. So naked viruses are a little bit harder to treat and they're more resilient. So that can be a disadvantage of an envelope because they're less stronger than their naked virus, than naked viruses. 
Okay, next is spikes. So spikes are basically surface proteins. They're glycoproteins. Glyco means sugar proteins, and they're basically outer surface projections. These spikes play an important role in the virus attaching and entering host cells. So they're very important targets for vaccine development. So this is an example of spikes. So for example, um, coronaviruses, which can cause, some of them can cause COVID, have spikes, and these spikes are used to attach to our human respiratory cells. So that's why spikes are important for viruses, and they are targets in vaccine and drug development. Okay, the final thing I want to say, so that was the structure, is just one last thing before we talk about viruses and animal viruses and bacterial viruses is just a small point. In the virus world, there is a small difference between what we call a virus and a viron. So when, vi when viruses are not in a host cell, like if someone sneezes and it's on a surface, we call that a viron. Viron are the inactive form of viruses outside of the body. So basically, they're when when you have the virus inside of you, we call it the virus. When you have the microbe, the infectious agent out inside of a living host, it's called a virus. When it is not, when it's on a surface or something non-living, we call it a viron. And I mean, they're basically almost the same thing. So viron is when it's outside the body. Okay. Now, since we talked a lot about how viruses are not alive, viruses can infect all forms of life and they need to infect some things to be able to make copies of themselves or replicate or multiply. And the reason why they need to infect a living host and what they infect is called the host is they take over the host's metabolic machinery and they can honestly, anything can be a host for a virus, anything alive. They can infect anything in the world that's living. They can infect flowers, they can infect plants, they can infect animals. Viruses can even infect bacteria because unlike viruses, bacteria are living organisms. So we're gonna go through learning about these different types of infections. Now, in terms of viruses, because again, this says the same thing as the last slide that viruses can infect all forms of life because they are not living and because they need to, a living organism to make copies of themselves. They have special ways of being grown in lab. So if we want to grow viruses in lab, we basically have a few ways. We can grow viruses in lab using bacteria as a host organism. Bacteriophages, sometimes just called phages, are just viruses that infect bacteria. So in this case, what happens is we grow these phages or these bacterial viruses and we let them infect bacteria. So you mix the phage, which is the virus, with the bacteria. And as the phages infect, they cause the bacteria to lice or die, and they leave clear spots that are called plaques. So the plaque indicates that the bacteria have died. So here is bacteria, and every time you see this clearing or this hole, it's a plaque. And that means that a phage killed a bacteria. And this replicates and spreads to surrounding cells until you see more holes or plaques. So the cool thing about these plaques is that each one originates just from one single virus particle. So we can use this to calculate plaques, to calculate the concentration of phage in a sample. And this is important in science. So this is one way that we can grow viruses or bacteriophage, bacterial viruses in lab. Now in the lab, there's three methods that are commonly used to study animal viruses, not bacterial viruses. So now I'm talking about animal viruses. And these methods involve using living animals, embryonated eggs, or cell cultures. So I'm gonna start with living animals. So the first point, 
So some viruses can only grow in living animals like mice, rabbits, etc., or pigs. And so if you're studying these, you have to use living animals. You can understand how this can have a lot of ethical implications. Another way that animal viruses can be studied in lab is they can be studied in embryonated eggs. That basically means fertilized eggs. So viruses are grown in fertilized eggs. And this this method basically involves injecting the virus into the egg's fluid, and then you can look at viral growth by looking at damage to the embryo or the egg's membrane, and this is important for producing certain vaccines, and this is why if you've ever wondered why you're asked if you are allergic to eggs, sometimes when you get a vaccine, it's because there could be just um, basically egg byproducts because of this. And then finally, this is a very popular way to grow viruses in lab. So cell cultures nowadays are usually used instead of embryonated eggs for growing viruses. So cells from animal tissue, human tissue, for example, are grown in lab, and they form layers that the viruses can infect. This method is more convenient and it lets us basically observe how viruses affect cells. So what happens here is the viruses that are grown in cell cultures can cause cell damage, and that's called the cytopathic effect, and that's used to basically quantify viral infection. And what continuous cell lines means is some lines can keep growing in the lab, and these are used for ongoing viral research, and we call this these continuous cell lines. So an example, a famous example of this is HeLa cells, which basically provide a constant supply of cells for studying viruses. So basically to summarize this, living animals and embryonated eggs have historically been used to grow and study viruses, but in reality, these days cell cultures have become a lot more prevalent because they're more convenient and you get a lot of detailed observation. Okay, now on to studying, talking about viruses that infect bacteria or bacteriophages. So bacteriophages, or sometimes just called phages, are bacterial viruses, and they are very important ecologically for our world. So they're just basically, whenever I use this word, I'm not talking about a human virus or an animal virus or a plant virus. It's just a bacterial virus. And in these bacteria phages or phages, all they are made up of is a capsid, and in the capsid, there, there is DNA. The reason why bacteriophages are important is they are, well, first of all, they're one of the most numerous viruses on earth. They're more than any other type of virus on earth. And they have a very important job. They manage bacterial populations. So you can find there are plenty of them in oceans and rivers, and they help take out too much bacteria. Now, another thing that is important medically is in lab, we can study phages. So we can study phages so that we can use them as models for learning about animal viruses. And finally, there's something called phage therapy. So phages have the potential to target specific bacteria that are causing infection, and we call that phage therapy. And it could potentially be better than antibiotics because you can be you can target specific bacteria instead of giving someone antibiotics and also potentially harming their good bacteria their good microbiome so that's why bacteriophages are important Okay, a little bit more about bacteriophages. So bacteriophages, again, this is just a fancy word for viruses that infect bacteria. I'm just gonna call them viruses for now to simplify it or phages. They have two main life cycles, the lytic cycle, where basically they destroy their host and their host is bacteria, and the lysogenic cycle, where their phage viral DNA gets incorporated into the bacteria's genome. And this basically causes evolution of, or um, it causes a bacteria's own genome to evolve and change. So in the lytic cycle, in the lytic cycle, the virus will replicate 
and it will destroy or lyse the host cell, which is bacteria, and release many different virus particles. In the lysogenic cycle, the virus will integrate into the host's, the bacteria's own DNA, and it can stay dormant for a long time without harming the bacteria. It can also give the bacteria new genes, and at some point, it can get activated again and switch to the lytic cycle. So the take-home message in this is in the lytic cycle, if, the, if we say something is a lytic phage, that lytic phage will kill bacteria. If we say that something is a lysogenic phage, it will change the genetic properties of the bacteria. And just keep in mind that the lytic cycle results in death. So lytic cycle means the bacteria die. Lysogenic cycle can later become turn into the lytic cycle. Okay, we'll talk about these individually. Now, here's a nice picture of bacteria phage or bacterial viruses or phage infecting a bacterial cell. So here is the phage, the virus, and it's injecting its DNA because it's a DNA virus into the bacteria. So here's the bacteria. And by the way, this is a lytic phage, so it's not shown in this image, but it does cause the bacterial cell to burst or lice. Okay, here are the steps in the lytic cycle. And this actually helps us understand human viruses as well because they're very simple. So in the beginning, what happens is this is how all viruses work. The virus or the phage attaches to the bacterial cell. So it attaches and then it penetrates, meaning it injects its DNA into the bacteria. The phage DNA is then uses the bacteria's own machinery to make more copies of the DNA and also to turn that DNA into viral protein. And then once you do that, all the protein, the viral protein is put together. That's called maturation. And then once those cells are once those viruses not cells are put together they are they cause the bacterial cell to lice or break open and many more viruses are released so that they can go on and infect more bacteria and one thing I want to say is that phages are very host specific what that means is if I tell you something is an E. coli phage that means it's an E. coli virus. That means it only infects E. coli. If, for example, I tell you something is a salmonella phage, it only infects salmonella. Okay, this is a nice video that explains this. Virulent phages carry out a simple life cycle called the lytic cycle. The phage attaches to the host cell during the attachment stage and then penetrates the host cell and injects its DNA during the penetration stage. After penetration, the phage causes the host DNA to break into small pieces. The phage then uses the host machinery to synthesize new copies of its DNA. This process is part of the biosynthesis stage. Biosynthesis also involves production of viral proteins. Once biosynthesis is complete, the phage components are assembled into virions during the maturation or assembly stage. In the release stage of the lytic cycle, the cell lyses, releasing the phage virions. These released phages go on to infect other cells. And that's the lytic cycle. So attachment, penetration, you let out your DNA, then the virus's DNA use the host's machinery to synthesize or make more copies. Then you convert the viral DNA into viral protein. You put all of them together and then the virus is released and goes on to infect more bacteria. Okay, now this one is a nice um, way to see the lysogenic cycle. Temperate bacteriophages carry out two types of life cycle, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. The lytic cycle for temperate bacteriophages is similar to the lytic cycle for virulent phages. The phage attaches to the host cell during the attachment stage and then penetrates the host cell and injects its DNA during the penetration stage. In temperate bacteriophages, the phage DNA forms a circle, 
which can either replicate and be transcribed to produce phage components in the lytic cycle or can proceed to the lysogenic cycle. During the biosynthesis stage of the lytic cycle, the phage DNA directs the host cell to synthesize viral components. The phage components are assembled into virions during the maturation or assembly stage. In the release stage of the lytic cycle, the cell lyses, releasing the phage virions. These released phages can go on to infect other cells. Recall that temperate phages can proceed either to the lytic cycle or the lysogenic cycle shortly after penetration. In the lysogenic cycle, the phage DNA integrates within the bacterial chromosome by recombination. The inserted phage DNA... Okay, so I just want to say one thing about this. So right now they're going to demonstrate the lysogenic cycle. So we talked about the lytic cycle. The lytic cycle causes bacteria to lyse and die. The lysogenic cycle is different. And we're going to talk about it in the next slide. But basically what happens is the phage will come. It will attach to the bacteria. It will inject its DNA, its viral DNA. But now what happens is that viral DNA gets integrated. So this is the green is the viral DNA into the bacteria's own DNA, changing the genetic properties of the bacteria. That's why it's called lysogenic. And he'll continue with it. It is called a prophage. Most of the phage proteins are repressed by two repressor proteins that are products of the phage genes. Whenever the bacterium reproduces, the prophage is also copied. The prophage is excised from the host chromosome in a process called induction. Induction can occur spontaneously through recombination or some other genetic event, or through the action of UV light or certain chemicals. At this point, the phage may enter the lytic cycle. Okay, here is the lysogenic cycle on its own. So in the lysogenic cycle, you have the same thing with all viruses. So first you have the phage it attaches to the bacterial cell. The phage injects its DNA. That DNA gets integrated into the bacteria's own DNA. And when you have the phage DNA integrated into the bacteria's own DNA, we have a fancy word for that called prophage. Again, prophage is when the viral phage DNA is in the bacteria's own DNA. Now in the lysogenic cycle, nothing could happen. This You could get to this step. And now at this point, the bacteria just lives normally. It's continually making copies of its own DNA, but while it does so, it's also making copies of the virus's DNA, but nothing is happening. But what I wanna say is sometimes at some point in its life, that lysogenic cycle can turn into the lytic cycle and cause the bacteria to die. Now it may never happen, but it can also, it can happen. And this right here, like, for example, this prophage right here, anytime you have viral DNA integrated into the bacteria's own DNA, we call that the lysogenic cycle, that means that the virus gave the bacteria new DNA. And one example of where we see this is, for example, um, E. coli, there is a strain of E. coli that causes someone to be really sick, like, like a type of food poisoning. And that strain, that specific strain has a gene in it that it gained evolutionarily over time from viruses that allow it to produce toxins. And there's other examples of bacteria like Vibrio cholera is a bacterium that causes really, that causes cholera, which can be deadly diarrhea. And in that case, you also have it the bacteria changed or evolved over time from gaining this gene from the virus from the phage and then botulism bacteria as well. So this right here is there, it's called specialized transduction. So this can be done in biotech where you can change the genetic properties of bacteria by infecting them with bacteria phage that do the lysogenic cycle. Again, this is lysogenic cycle, not lytic cycle, because the lytic cycle kills bacteria. The lysogenic cycle changes their genetic properties.
Okay, and then here is an image of lytic cycle. So in the lytic cycle, again, the phage attaches, the phage will inject its DNA, and then it will cause the basically the bacterial cell to lyse and die. So the lytic cycle is on its own. On the lysogenic cycle, phage will inject its DNA into the bacteria that gets integrated into the bacteria's own DNA. We call that prophage. And that could be the lysogenic cycle, but just keep in mind that at some point, something may happen in the bacteria's lifetime that can trigger the lysogenic cycle to turn into the lytic cycle. So some phages, so, okay, there's the lytic cycle causes bacteria to die. Lysogenic cycle changes the genetic properties of bacteria. And then there are some phages that can have both lytic and lysogenic cycle. We call those temperate phages. Okay, so now we just covered bacteria phage. We are done with bacteria phage. And now we're gonna talk about animal viruses. Animal viruses, and but what I mean by animal viruses is I mean both animal and human viruses, are viruses that infect animals and they're common causes of many diseases. So animal viruses infect animals and humans and they can be very diverse and complex. And we can see here are some examples. There's many, many more. So here is adenovirus. Again, the adenovirus has its viral genome and has a protein coat called a capsid. Adenovirus can cause various things like respiratory infections. We see HIV, here's HIV virus. HIV virus is an RNA retrovirus. We'll talk about what that is. There's a virus that causes pink eye or conjunctivitis. So there's that. We have human influenza virus, herpes virus, hepatitis virus, chickenpox virus, many, many more. And what I'd like you guys to know is that animal viruses, like all viruses, there's DNA viruses and there's RNA viruses. So for bacteriophage, all bacteriophage or all viruses that infect bacteria are DNA viruses. But for animal viruses, animal viruses are can be, there is human DNA or animal viruses, and there's human RNA viruses. And it doesn't really mean anything other than the, than the composition inside the capsid is different. And they're categorized based on the type of nucleic acid that they use to store their genetic information. So DNA viruses have DNA as their gen genetic material, and the DNA can be double-stranded or single-stranded. RNA viruses use RNA as their genetic material and the RNA can be double-stranded or single-stranded. And so we're going to go through some examples of these, but just to keep in mind, DNA viruses usually have a lower mutation rate compared to RNA viruses because in RNA viruses, there's more mutation with the enzyme there. Examples of DNA viruses include herpes viruses, which can cause cold sores, and we have papilloma viruses, which can cause warts and cervical cancer, adenoviruses, which can cause respiratory illnesses, hepatitis viruses, which can affect your liver. Examples of RNA viruses are influenza viruses, coronaviruses, retroviruses like HIV. So I don't want you to memorize that these viruses are RNA and these are DNA. I do not want you to memorize it. I just want you to know that some viruses are DNA viruses and some are RNA viruses. And here's a good video before we explain how these viruses make us sick, how they make copies of themselves. Animal viruses vary based on the type of nucleic acid they possess, as well as whether they are naked or enveloped. Each variance results in different types of life cycles. A naked and an envelope virus will attach to and penetrate a host differently. Animal viruses without an envelope are referred to as naked viruses. They bind to the surface of the host cell and inject their DNA into the host cell in a manner similar to bacteriophages. Some envelope viruses infect their host by binding to receptors on the host cell. The envelope of the virus then merges with the host membrane and the capsid enters the cell. 
After entry, the capsid opens and releases the viral genetic material into the cytoplasm of the cell. Upon attachment, some envelope viruses infect their host by inducing phagocytosis, in which the host cell envelops the viral envelope and absorbs the virus into its cytoplasm. When the virus has entered the cell, the outer and inner part of the envelope merge together, and the capsid is released into the cytoplasm. At this point, the capsid opens up and releases the viral genetic material into the host cell cytoplasm. The type of nucleic acid in an animal virus will determine how the viral nucleic acid and proteins are synthesized. When the single-stranded DNA genome of a parvovirus enters a host cell and invades its nucleus, a complementary strand is produced for the single-stranded viral DNA. This DNA is then replicated normally. Messenger RNA is transcribed and transported into the cytoplasm, where viral capsomere proteins are produced. At some point after synthesis has begun, the capsomere proteins enter the nucleus of the host, and the virions containing the original single-stranded DNA are assembled. In a virus with double-stranded DNA in its genome, the DNA also migrates to the nucleus, where it's replicated by the host enzymes in the same way that the host's DNA is normally replicated. Messenger RNA is made from the viral DNA in the nucleus, and viral capsomere proteins are made in the cytoplasm from the messenger RNA. The capsomere proteins enter the nucleus, and the virions are assembled in the host nucleus. After assembly, the virions accumulate in the cytoplasm and prepare for release from the host cell. Some viruses have a single-stranded RNA genome that can act directly as messenger RNA. This strand is called the positive strand or sent strand RNA. This messenger RNA is read by host ribosomes to make viral proteins. The virus carries a unique RNA polymerase that makes a complementary negative strand, also called an anti-sense strand, from the original positive strand. There is no known animal equivalent of this RNA-dependent polymerase. The negative strand RNA can act as a template for more positive strand RNA. Positive strand single-stranded RNA viruses are assembled in the cytoplasm of the host cell when the RNA and the proteins have all been produced. Viruses with single-stranded negative sense RNA are in a special situation. Their RNA will not act as messenger RNA until it's been transcribed into the positive sense strand complement of the original negative anti-sense strand RNA. To accomplish this feat, the viruses carry their own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which transcribes the RNA into the positive strand. When the positive strand has been produced, it acts as the template for both protein synthesis and more negative strand RNA. When the virion is packaged, it must contain the negative strand RNA in addition to copies of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. When double-stranded RNA viruses infect a host cell, the positive, sent strand of the RNA acts as a messenger RNA for protein production. One of the proteins coded is an RNA polymerase that uses the negative strand to make more positive strand RNA. The positive strand also acts as a template to make more negative strand RNA. The two strands come together and are packaged along with the polymerase in the virion. Retroviruses make up a special class of positive strand RNA viruses. When a retrovirus infects a cell, its positive strand RNA is reverse transcribed into a DNA negative strand by a viral reverse transcriptase. This negative strand DNA is further transcribed to double-stranded DNA, which serves as a template for the viral RNA genome. This positive strand RNA also serves as the template for viral protein synthesis. The reverse transcriptase is packaged with the mature virion 
as it's essential for the successful reproduction of the virus. Just like the beginning of the life cycle, naked viruses differ from envelope viruses in how they assemble and release. Naked viruses generally leave their host cell by accumulating to such numbers that the cell lyses, spilling virions into the extracellular medium free to infect new hosts. This kills the host cell and generally causes inflammation and infection in the tissue where the host cell is found. Envelope viruses leave the host cell by merging with one of the cell's membranes, the nuclear membrane, the endoplasmic reticulum, or the cytoplasmic membrane. During synthesis, some viral glycoproteins are embedded in cellular membranes, and these glycoproteins act as a recognition system for the viral capsid. The cell membrane surrounds the capsid and forms a bud on the outer surface of the cell which pinches off and forms a protective envelope for the virus, which is then free to infect other host cells. An advantage of the envelope is that the virus does not need to break the cell to be released, so the cell can stay alive longer while it continues to produce and bud off more viruses. The type of nucleic acid, along with the presence or absence of an envelope, will determine the type of life cycle a given animal virus will have. Okay, this was a very detailed video, but I wanted to keep it here. And obviously you can fast forward if you want, but basically this is describing the three main steps about how viruses cause infection in us. First, they have to attach to our cells. Then they have to basically penetrate or inject their genetic material. That genetic material could be DNA or RNA, it could be double-stranded DNA, it could be single-stranded DNA, it could be positive sense, single-stranded RNA, negative RNA, or double-stranded RNA. This all depends on what the virus is. So you can look up any virus. So coronavirus will be different than like hepatitis viruses genome. So it injects that. Then once you have that, depending on which one you have, it's going to have a different mechanism about how it converts that into viral protein. That's the goal in the end. And don't worry about the details and the differences between them. What I just want you guys to get from this is the virus attaches it penetrates or injects its genetic material, which can be any one of these. Then those in their own way will get converted using the, the organism's own enzymes and own machinery like ribosomes into viral proteins. Then the viral proteins will get put together and then they'll have to be, uh, uh, so they're assembled together and then they have to be released so that they can go on and infect more cells. So that is how infection happens. And so this is the step-by-step -step what that video showed. So if we're thinking about just a general DNA virus, DNA virus first has to attach to the host cell, let's say like a human respiratory cell. It can do that using its spikes. If it has spikes, it can use that using its envelope. If it has an envelope, it can do that using its capsid. So once it attaches, it will penetrate, meaning it will fuse with our cells it will uncoat, the capsid will get removed. Once the capsid is removed, we have the viral DNA inside the host cell. That viral DNA will do two things. It will make copies of itself. So we'll say DNA replication using the host cell's enzymes. Um, and it will get transcribed and translated into viral protein that will get put together. And then those virus particles will get released. They can get released either by causing the host cell to lyse, that's what naked viruses do, or they can bud out and that is how they get an envelope. So with RNA viruses, it's practically the same thing. There's only one tiny difference instead of having DNA as the genome, RNA gets injected in the host cell. And when the RNA is injected into the host cell, it is copied. So uh, we're using something called RNA, RNA dependent RNA polymerase that comes from the virus itself. And that RNA is translated into protein. And then finally, you put all those virus particles together and they get released. So this is a copy slide of what was said in the other slide. And so again, here's what we have with animal viruses, DNA viruses. They attach, 
the virus will get uncoated, meaning the capsid gets removed, you have biosynthesis, all the parts get put together and the virus gets released. And so now we're going to talk about how vir animal viruses enter because this is very important because if they can't enter cells, then they can't cause infection. So the way that viruses enter animal cells is it can be done in one of two ways. The virus itself can fuse with the plasma membrane of the host cell of the human cell, for example, or the animal cell. And this can only happen with enveloped viruses. So enveloped viruses, they have the advantage in that they can enter our cells by just fusing with our cells. And the reason they can do that is that the envelope is made up of a lipid bilayer, which is what our cells are made of of. So it's an easy way for the virus to enter cells. Now, the other way that viruses enter cells and all viruses can do this, whether you're enveloped or you're naked, meaning you don't have an envelope, is where our cells accidentally eat up the virus. And this is called endocytosis. So our cells do something called endocytosis, where they eat up material. And so sometimes viruses get eaten up. And please keep in mind that a lot of treatment on viral infections is to stop viruses from entering cells. So sometimes they work on these components, but these treatments usually can only work at the beginning of an infection. Okay, it's also important for viruses in order to cause an infection to leave our cells. So the way that viruses can be released is two ways. Naked viruses, basically the reason they're naked is they cause the host cell to just slice or break open and then they get removed. And then the way that enveloped viruses gained an enveloped is just through budding out. So enveloped viruses can gain that lipid bilayer by getting pinched off the host cell. So that is the way that animal viruses are released. Naked viruses are just released from lysing and then with budding enveloped viruses, that's how they get their envelope. 